Good morning, welcome, and thank you for joining us. I am Kira Epstein, the program coordinator for the New School at Commonweal. And today we welcome Tiffany Patton as our host in uh, the, ser the second of the three conversations in this year's Roots of Resilience in an Age of Crisis series, co-presented with Real Food Media. Tiffany will be in conversation with Carl Wassily and Peleke Flores about their efforts to protect keystone species, livelihoods, and cultures along the coasts of the Pacific Northwest and in Hawaii. Tiffany and I want to welcome you this morning and thank you for participating in the series. We also want to thank John Russell from the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, who is also co-presenting with us today. He will be joining us later during the question and answer time at the end of the presentation. If you missed past conversations in this series, you can find them on our website, tns.commonweal.org. We have had four other conversations in this series about land, seed, water, uh, water, and last month's soil, speaking with incredible people doing some really inspiring work in these areas. So we hope if you haven't seen those, you'll find them and watch or listen to those as well. I want to thank Ken Adams, who's uh, helping us from behind the scenes with production. And I think that is it. So we'll, we'll, we're ready to begin. Carl Wassily, Peleke Flores, and Tiffany Patton, welcome to the New School at Commonweal. Thank you, Kira, and thank you, Ken, and everyone at the New School at Commonweal for hosting us again um, for our second uh, year of the Roots of Resilience Speaker Series. Um, I'm Tiffany Patton with Real Food Media. Um, we develop media and communication strategies with movements to help shape their own food and agriculture systems and to take on corporate power. Today's event, uh, See the Struggle for Sovereignty, was put together with the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, a fisherman-led organization building a movement towards vibrant marine ecosystems and thriving fishing communities. Uh, the Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance and Open Media are both members of Heal Food Alliance, and I'm just really thrilled that they were able to share their expertise and networks with us to make today possible. So for the first like 50 minutes, uh, I'm going to facilitate a, dis a discussion with Peleke and Carl, and then we're going to open it up to audience Q&A. So as we're talking, if you have questions, take note of them, and we'll have plenty of time to answer them. And lucky for us, John Russell, uh, NAMA's food justice organizer, will be joining Peleke and Carl on screen during that portion, and we'll be ready to answer any questions you might have. So without further ado, um, Peleke, if you could tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got to um, do your work today. Hello, my name is Peleke Flores. And yeah, I guess I got to do my work currently right now. Just been always part of living growing up. Um, I was lucky to have family that still farm taro patches and salt beds and Actually, fish ponds was a little missing piece learn of learning within our Ahupua system or a division of land that, um, that goes from the mountain to the sea. So like there's different parts in there and got to learn like tar patch versions of it and some see the ocean parts of it, but to understand that middle portion or fish pond portion was, wasn't until the past 12 to 14 years now. Um, and yeah, it's currently just trying to save whatever we had or anything that Aina systems. Um, Aina for us is the land that which feeds. Um, it's not just any land, but the lands that our kupuna made productive in order for our people to thrive on on this little rock in the middle of the ocean. Um, yeah, I guess. I'll end up here in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And where are you currently? Can you tell us a little bit about the background? Oh, currently I'm at our work site, um, Alacoco Fish Pond. Uh, it's a restoration project we have going on with our nonprofit organization called Malamuhuli'ia. And it's, the, it's a 39 acre fish pond that is 
the largest one on this island, not on all of our all our islands, but um, yeah, it's been neglected for a while uh, with the um, introduction of mangrove to our system that's really been damaging our water system and native habitat um, for food. So it's kind of doing the opposite for us here in Hawaii versus other places in the world where mangrove is really good. Um, but we do have enough plants and systems that we are getting affected. So we have to, that's how our nonprofit start was to take out the mangrove to save this six or this 800 year old um, fish pond and try to restore it and kind of show our community the knowledge of fish ponds and how it's important to our environment and our wildlife um, and how it functions. Thank you. And Carl, you were born and raised in Alaska, rooted deep in salmon culture and salmon communities. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your work today and sort of um, a little bit about your journey to get here? Thank you for the introduction. And um, I look forward to this discussion. My name is Angu uh, Tak, it's the Yupik name. Um, my English name is, uh, Western name is Carl Wasley. And, um, yeah, it's been a long journey. I, you know, the Exxon Valdez oil spills really impacted me as a child. I thought everybody fished, uh, fished and gathered, gathered off the, the coast and, you know, seaweeds and medicines from the forest. And I thought that was just a normal part of life. But, uh, the Exxon Valdez oil spill uh, came a thousand miles down the coast and balls of animals that we uh, we hunt, and, um, including uh, birds and marine mammals, uh, whirled up in tar balls and changed my life forever. Uh, it, but that, that, that really opened my eyes to like the industrialization of, of, of the North Pacific. Um, uh, when that happened, I was going K through 12 in Seward, Alaska, uh, the northernmost ice free port in the Pacific. And, um, but, uh, you know, I grew up uh, also going to fish camp on the Kuskokwim, which is in the Bering Sea watershed. And uh, you pick, uh, we share the Inuit culture. So we're a circumpolar culture. Um, and, uh, Yupik are, uh, we, it just, uh, the Yuk or Yupik, we, uh, we, uh, as real people, we have an obligation, uh, to uphold the, uh, the awareness of, of who we are as humans in relation to, uh, to the land, to our relatives of, 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 of this, what we call Mother Earth, as well as the cosmos and the universe. So the, so the, 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 to be aware is to be aware of everything, um, including those we can't, things we can't see. So, so I guess I'll, uh, on a fundamental level, I am a sand, salmon person, so I share that circumpolarly as well. Um, we got some of the last stronghold left in Alaska of, uh, of wild salmon, um, and uh, and freedom of uh, of rivers, large rivers um, from. Uh, multiple generations fighting hydro dams, which have caused a lot of problems in the Pacific Northwest with salmon. And, but a lot of the work I do is uh, protecting Mother Earth and large scale ecosystems. Our culture is highly dependent on the migratory species of migratory birds from around the, the, the Northern Hemisphere, but also the Southern Hemisphere, um, migratory marine mammals. Uh, as well, um, and migratory land animals. And of course, uh, where I'm from, it's most of a, the, it's the salmon. The salmon are, are a critical part of our food year round, even though we only harvest them for a few months in the summer and the fall. Uh, we've developed techniques to be able to store them for a long time without uh, without just using the energy of the sun. And we've been doing that for thousands of years uh, for storage preservation. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just, that, that's my introduction at this point is I, I work with a lot of organizations around Turtle Island. Um, and uh, 
yeah, thank thank you all for for getting on today. I appreciate the uh, having this discussion here. Thank you both. Come from cultures that have a specific fish at its cornerstone. Um, Pelike, can you tell me a little bit about the importance of the mullet fish to your culture? Actually, within this types of fish ponds, well, I guess in Hawaii we get six different styles of fish ponds, ranging from freshwater, brackish, and a little bit saltier. But with the most famous fish grown within these fish ponds, were talk about is our mullet, our striped mullet, or we call it ama ama or anai, depending on its um, throat stage, but definitely been written before, like mentioned in documents from one of our, I believe it's our elites that talk about during the time of the Western contact and seeing our people's populations going down and our movement, our people's getting ripped off of certain kuleana or like responsibilities, growing food. Um, fish ponds took a big effect on that. And we didn't see in the mullet population <laughs> fall. It was referenced that, that Ali also observed the reflection of our people falling at the same time too. So like there's two portions. One of them, they talk about our, our main starch plant, the uh, kalo. Kalo for us, like they would tie in genealogically that as that, watching that, is like another resemblance of our people falling too. And same thing with the mullet and how important it was to our people at that time. We ask our people now what their favorite fish or what the most famous fish, duck, <laughs> um, salmon or tuna. <laughs> mm -hmm. Our people eat more salmon than they do eat our own fish now. Not in a bad way. But, um, so kind of getting our movement back of showing how important the mullet were to our people living here and to the ecosystem and everything else um, within the fish pond system, at least. Um, but it's definitely a wide variety of fish, but that was the one more famous fish that had a lot of stories coming down and how fish ponds used to brag about the, the wealth, the health of their fish pond by the fatness of their mullets or the sweetness mm -hmm. of their mullets and, um, or how much, how that, the area where we catch it in the makaha, how it's so compact that you could walk over the backs of them because it filled up that, that alleyway. Um, so those are just stories that we hold on to that we strive to get back to again, teach the next generation how to get to that point. Um, and now we're a lot in restoration stage, just saving the system that grew it. And hopefully the next generation will pick up that ball and start pushing to the stories that our kupuna, our ancestors had about how fruitful and sweet things were in their time bringing that 800 years before, six to 800 years before, bringing it to our generation, pushing it forward another six to 800 years. But definitely the mullet is a big movement within the fish pond realm here in Hawaii. Okay, thank you. And Carl, can you tell me um, just a little bit about, like, I'd like to hear in your words why salmon is so sacred. Yeah, just like uh, um, Peleke said, you know, it's like the salmon is to, you get a good harvest. It's the wealth of the of, of not just the family or clan or or, or tribe or, or village is, is 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 about how much salmon you have. It's not, and it's not just about the, the 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 accumulation. It's actually in our culture. It's about the sharing of that at celebrations, a time of struggle of other families or other villages that may be suffering because they didn't get enough salmon. So there's purposeful celebrations throughout, the, especially the, the winter and the spring were really important because that's when food sources might be low, but those that gathered a uh, seal or uh, a whale or, and uh, caribou and uh, other proteins, uh, you know, cause the, the seal and whale are really important for the vitamins in the dark days of the winter, dark cold days, they're, they're, they're warm and they keep, 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 uh, they're really full of vitamins, and then you add our, our salmon that's preserved with the with berries that are preserved, um, and we have a really rich rich richness of of the culture that's connected to the salmon. The salmon are 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 the the basic. You can consider the Western word would be called staple, 
but the, the sacredness of the salmon is important and its whole life cycle is reflected on uh, the ultimate sacrifice. It's uh, when, when the salmon uh, return to our rivers, there's multiple species of salmon. So some of them are collapsing due to a combination of industrial trawlers coming further, following the sea ice further north, as well as climate, just the ocean acidification in the northern regions and whatnot. Anyways, the point is that the salmon are sacred from from, from the sea. They, the, some, you know, the Chinook would used to be the the biggest and strongest. They spent the longest time in the sea, getting as much eating the rich resources of the sea, whether it's as a young, young, the young fingerlings, the little small salmon, after they spawn, they go out, they get, uh, we call it machiak, they get, uh, they get purified they, uh, from the land, they go out to the sea during the spring melt, uh, after the snow melts and the rivers uh, unfreeze, they, 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 they flush out to the wetlands. Sometimes they get stuck in, in lakes and ponds and you know they still survive but they, they i think they're called they call them steelheads anyways they're they're a salmonoid but but some end up lying off and some end up uh, on the coast uh, in the seal grass beds and uh so 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 and then uh, those chinooks spend a long time out at sea and then the, some of the other species don't spend as much time but they gather those nutrients and go up, the Chinook can go 2,000 miles across multiple uh, international boundaries, that are arbitrary boundaries, um, and spawn in the highest mountains um, and in, in the millions. Um, it's not happening in the millions anymore. The Chinook are, could be extinct, extinct and in my lifetime, I've seen the massive collapse, even in Alaska, of Chinook. Um, but uh, we still have hope for other species to continue to thrive. So the sacredness is 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 reflected, and not just sharing with the community for 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 celebration, but it's also and ceremony, but it's also uh, a part of the, the the natural cycle of the land and the earth. Uh, all, 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 even bears, uh, the, the berries, uh, the seagulls, the eagles, and ravens, and all, all these other animals uh, are so dependent on the returning of the nutrients and at the top of these mountains that spread throughout the land and the birds um, spread even further as they fly around the world. So that's the sacredness of the salmon from my perspective. Thank you. Um, Kaleke, can you tell me what are some of the biggest threats to the mullet fish population and the other like native fish populations in Hawaii? There's a lot of big threats. Um, I know everybody is familiar with the three most popular ones of so overfishing, pollution, climate change. But um, I guess here in Hawaii, I'd like to point out two things for us. <laughs> Definitely the illegal occupation of America, which started that and provided avenues for all different kinds of things to kind of push down our systems and people. Um, and then the second part is like a big puzzle piece kind of share with people like we got a natural bloom of fish that's happening like before, like because with our wall, it's carbon dated about six to and six to eight hundred years old. Uh, but we still got to do confirmation with our genealogical like timeline and see, match our stories up with those carbon dates and see how much more did it miss. Cause, um, but what people ask a lot like, oh, what was this place like um, before the wall was put here? And it's like, I don't know. I don't think anybody else knows. Nobody documented that 800 years ago. <laughs> but if we were to just play out scenarios, use the names that we got and break down the words and kind of like use it today's modern day scientific methods to help prove a lot of our um, like word functions, I guess our Hawaiian word functions. Um, we talk about going back to those three negatives um, that is affecting our fish population. Uh, people don't really, so in order to get that three negatives, at least here in Hawaii, you're looking at like, what is our pinpoint that is starting 
that negative downfall or you know data collection. So like for me and like my like learning from Kupuna or elder, it's like it's and my own um like great grandmother and stuff talking about how they she remember when she was a little kid seeing you know bubbles of fish in the ocean or in you know estuary areas where there's like big black balls just bubbling and um they used to do hukilaos more often. Hukilao is a form of netting that, you know, a lot of the communities always did. So today looking at that, that would be considered overfishing because <laughs> they used to do that pretty regularly, but there's a lot of fish back then. So if you think of that population story and then putting on the events that's happening today of the negative effects to that depletion is a big puzzle piece missing for us. It's like, what helped get to that story in the first place? What helped build those numbers in the first place? Because um, that wasn't just, well, there is a natural part of it, but there's also bloom part of it. Like our people fight to the system and made even more in a way. So that part I like to share is that missing puzzle piece is the downfall of our native, our Hawaiian fish ponds. So there was a count, excuse me, it's loud helicopter passing. There's a count of about 450 something fish ponds that um, I think in the 80s or 70s that counted um, our Hawaiian fish ponds around all the islands. But within the Kauai Island um, report, there are name, we know of fish ponds who are not named on this report. So we know that there were a lot of, a lot more fish ponds missing. So even if we took the lower count um, within our fish ponds, even for our people too, we're all still relearning a lot of this knowledge because the elders have been passing away. But people look at it as a fish pond where we go and get fish from, but missing like the food, like I guess the more, right now it's like a hidden purpose of the fish pond, but we're learning more that we look at fish pond with that mind frame of an incubator where it's a precious resource that actually houses, within a brackish water estuary, it actually houses a lot of baby fish. Um, it's building that phytoplankton, zooplankton bloom that fills all the, feeds all the filter feeders. So naturally, before this wall, we had a small section where the fresh water and the salt water meets in this little pocket. They'll have this, we call it, well, fresh water in Hawaiian is called vai, salt water is called kai. Um, when you put the two together for brackish water, it's vai kai. But when that brackish water gets that right nutrients inside, it's called vai momona, that sweet tasting water. And within that sweet tasting water, they realize that these baby fish or these, there's action going on inside here. So if naturally we had this little pond growing and attracting all these baby fish, maybe attracting about, I just trying numbers in there, but 10,000 fish within this little area, you know, like, you know, less than an acre or something, about an acre worth. And then they expanded this space enough where it's maxed out to about 39 acres. And they realize if they slow down the water, they'll amplify this by momona, this sweetness, so that it'll build more food to attract and be able to feed more babies. So now from the 10,000, they boomed it to about a million. And then with that 450, so this next part of the island, there's another million, another million, another million. And all these baby fish are going in and out of the fish pond. So as they get out of the fish pond and then high tide there, you know, there's gonna have the omnivores and the predators and all those other fishes picking off at it. So they're feeding that system. And these are the overflow. And then that wild system is on the, the shorelines and that's getting fed. So like these incubators pushing out food to feed the wild population. Plus we get into overflow that stayed inside and that overflow is what we're eating out of. So like there's a wider spread mm -hmm. of the fish populations rising in effects around us. I don't know if I'm going off subject, but let me know if you're on your question. <laughs> Start just ranting. Within that mode, um, can you remind me back what the question was? I'm no, just... the question was, um, what were some of the biggest threats? And you did answer that. And I think you also shared like a really important point, which is like, not only do we need to think about like, what is threatening these and like wild wildlife um, and like, animal relatives, but also like how do we care for them and like nurture them and create environments for them to thrive. And so, yeah. I guess we read that back, yeah. So that's where 
one of the threats are that's not really be talked talked about much, but it's because we're a growing renaissance yeah. group, and there's only about 40. Hello, my, my that baby was a baby cat. Uh, <laughs> we're, we're about 40 fish ponds right now represented within our our islands mm -hmm. that together once a month and try to help each other with all kind of stuff from education, permits, grants, physical work on the pond, fish, whatever each pond has qualities of ups and downs so that we all can help together to make that movement go. Like, yeah. So it's we're still in a long way and connecting to the other systems. Not we, we can't have a good fish pond unless the rest of the system is fixed too. Uh, within a fish pond realm, a bioindicator of a healthy fish pond is its bird, our native birds. If our native birds are there, that means everything else below it, like from the baby fish to the plants are all flourishing, that there's enough to feed them to and attract them here along with ourselves, the people. And then a bioindicator of a healthy ahupua system from the mountain to the sea within its land division is a healthy fish pond. A fish pond is healthy, that means the fresh water coming down is clean. If something happens to that to the fish pond and we can see water quality is messing up, we can look up to the mountain and see what, what system is messing that up and fine tune that back. Um, for the ocean, every time there's high tides that come to refeed that fish pond and we're noticing, hey, something's messing up every time there's high tide that we can check what's happening on our shorelines or what's going on within the ocean that is affecting. But then if both are balanced, the fish pond is balanced. So that would show the health of that this this land for the fish so there's a lot of those parts that i like to look at like not so much what is negatively but it's part of negative like but how can we make that back and reach to those storylines to make these fish counts bloom again um carl can you tell us uh, about some of the biggest threats to salmon population i know you, you kind of already touched on it but you could tell us some more specifics that would be great i talked a little bit about it but you know that the, what Pele Kip was saying was really important also, not only in our estuaries, where, 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 what you, we call the nurseries of our, of our, of our ocean, um, but also the nurseries of our families, um, that, that place where the fresh water makes the seawater is, is really important even in the sea ice. So the sea ice, when it's in the summertime, when you've got this melting sea ice, uh, it, 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 right below the ice, uh, and this, these are not glaciers. These are sea ice. The sea ice, right below that sea ice, is a is a layer that sweet water that that Pelike mentioned. So the ice is important for that. Also, it provides a huge surface area for the for for the sea water and fresh water meet, and it creates just this with the sun coming down twenty four seven in the summer in the summer months creates this amazing blooms of phytoplankton and and zooplankton and then feeder fish the salmon all migrate from all over the circumpolar north and move to underneath that sea ice to feed little little fingerlings so i've talked to whale hunters they don't uh they they didn't traditionally eat salmon but they saw the fingerlings coming in they said they'd come in and right under the sea ice and they'd be all over the place when they're out um, bowhead hunting or hunting uh, seal on the ice or walrus need the sea ice to rest and to, to brood their, their uh... anyway, so so we heard a lot about how these fingerlings would go under the sea ice, so we learn from each other that way as well, but that surface area is so rich uh, and understudied in western science but indigenous knowledge knows that that sea ice is so important for, 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 uh, for, for, the, for, the, for us so when we see the threats, it's the uh, industrialization, the military industrial complex moving north following the sea ice that's created by anthropogenic climate change. And uh, and the, the, they bring a lot of chemicals. And then, you know, we have a, a transportation corridors for nuclear waste being planned out from Russia to, and then uh, big, 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 huge industrial projects, offshore fishing, factory trawlers, uh, these are all threats, but but we also have the these threats on, in, inland too of, of say mega dams. Uh, we see the impacts uh, on both the Atlantic coast and the west coast to to not only to, to 
to uh, indigenous peoples, but to entire communities as well as fishing communities. So, um, and it's a false solution to climate change. So, so these things that are that are uh, they can be magnified uh, with mega industrialization. So the big big threats are these centralized systems of of colonial these colonial centralized systems that create a dependency on an, uh, on a wasteful uh, wasteful energy, wasteful uh, industrial agriculture, all these things that are, are causing mass amounts of, of changes to our atmosphere, but also our oceans. So I think, oh, and, and I just wanted to touch on another thing is these biotechnology solutions to continue moving these these uh these mega industrial processes as uh, uh the biotechnology solution is not a solution either the, the genetically engineered fish um that are being marketed as salmon now by aqua bounty is a huge threat because it's considered a sustainable <clears throat> sustainable solution to the collapse of our salmon and collapse in and, and or fish. Um, and um, it's an insult to our ecosystems and our peoples. Uh, like uh, like the, my DNA has wild salmon in it. And I, I'm not gonna replace that with some frankenfish. Uh, and plus it's, it's out of, it doesn't touch the natural waters or we, we can't do ceremony when it's in a warehouse and a petri dish. Anyways, the, the point is that's not a solution to the collapse of the salmon, the collapse of the fish. So, so we, we to, that, that, those are the, those are the big th threats is, that, that I see um, with, with the salmon. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that sort of like stems from colonialism and the, the need, um, a fake need to tr control everything. Um, privatize and control things. Can you talk a little bit, Carl, about the Aqua Act and its implications for food sovereignty? Well, great. Right. The, the the Aqua Act is just it's got it's it's got some good things in there, like every uh, you know, like just like the Magnuson Stevens Fisheries Act, which is to uh, start managing our fisheries from overfishing and that that there's a long history and I won't go into that but the aqua act is kind of a a move to to colonize our coastal areas um and go even further offshore into federal uh, jurisdiction which is the states have jurisdiction 2 miles and that and then after 2 miles it goes into the federal jurisdiction and there's talks about creating uh, fish pens that are just uh, just basically they're toxic pens where that 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 uh, they're just like online capos they carry a lot these fish carry a lot of diseases um there's there, there's there's problems with the genetic uh, 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 if there's problems with genetics uh, regarding the wild salmon be, being less able to uh, to survive um as well, so so the inner the, these these farm fish and farm salmon are 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 a huge threat. And, you know, on the positive side, like kelp farming is sustainable. That's something that doesn't require some weird feed of a mix of feeder fish that's endangered as well. That provides for the entire ecosystem. So, taking a bunch of feeder fish and throwing it into a fish fish farm offshore in these net pens is uh is not a solution to 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 food or or aquaculture at all it's actually a false solution so so there's there's a number of problems with the aqua act and 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 plus it allows for biotech firms to continue playing with the genetics of, of fish and other animals i mean it's just it's 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 a dangerous slope uh that we see um on a on a food level, but also just on a cultural, ethical, and moral uh, level as well. Um, when the solutions are to are, are are centered around communities, and and uh, that that that's where we're going to find the solutions: the communities, especially indigenous communities. 
And I think that's why we're having this discussion today. Mm -hmm. So community-centered solutions and not market-based solutions. Um, so in Hawaii, uh, like large agrochemical companies like Monsanto and Dow set up shop on like the islands of Hawaii to develop and test lots of genetically engineered corn uh, designed to be grown with so many toxic chemical co compounds. Um, and they had very little like regulatory oversight at first. And so the communities and the surrounding environments were devastated by all these negative impacts of toxins sprayed in the air and coursing through the water. So Pelike, can you tell us about the agricultural runoff situation in Hawaii and or other instances where corporate interests have taken priority over community health? Yeah, that's a whole other matrix with itself. Um, I guess would go back to that first root cause, you know, with the illegal occupation of um, Hawaii and um, from America and then allowing all these venues. So I guess the, when we look at that product today, yeah, everybody know that Monsanto and all those seed companies have their rep and what they do and stuff, but to be in Hawaii, like who were the guys allowing that to happen? Who were the guys like the ADC and stuff like they had a mission to provide the, these our lands for farmers to grow food to feed our peoples and they had a messed up rap within this past 20 years <laughs> they barely used the land and was hardly could show any evidence of food coming out of it but more test sites and gmo thing but definitely from the pesticides and herbicides going into our schools and affecting our our kids and um there's a big wrap around there but also it connecting with back like to the runoffs and our fisheries and systems on the west side like there's a big chunk of land that was there's a with one of those links that ted talks links is kind of like the same scenario this that ted talk links has thousands of acres bigger than what we have but it's basically it was a fish pond traditional fish pond that once western contact took over and started mono cropping like sugarcane and then went into the seed company stuff they had to divert water from those lands because it was brackish water that sweet water that was actually way more productive than what they ended up doing so building ditches diverting water away from those areas to dry it out and then start planting so that in itself depleted a whole natural like most natural food system just to grow another type of food system that really didn't help our community at all. You know, doing sugar cake company in that, that time and sending not a sugar off of our islands to the continent and wherever else. But like the resources to grow that sugar now is they had to take the water from another side of the island to water that plants there to send those resources off of our islands. And while well, they affect it, Taking that waters from those places affected other food systems like taro patches and fish ponds and everything else. So that major effect really was totally against the health of the community, especially our host community, our peoples here. And that's where how we, um, yeah, we're in that phase of trying to heal a lot of these spaces and try to have our people not relying on the system that was putting us to survive on and try to get back to our natural system so that when the matching containers stop you know like we don't we, we don't have anything you know like every like 90 percent of our resources from the clothes we wear to every or most of the food we eat and the cars we drive all coming in on those shipments so when that stalls like the whole island feels it you got two days worth of resources within the stores and everybody's on their own after that it's not too bad on Kauai. We have a lot of hunters and fishers and farmers on our island, but the really compact places like on Oahu where they're building the cities, it's like, yeah, they start going for broke because they don't even have a yard to plant food in um, when they're stacked up on buildings. But yeah, that's part of that. Stop now before I start ranting off into another subject. <laughs> those are the effects from those companies that are still going on. Um, we're trying our best in other places to use, reuse those lands. A lot of lands are now vacant because of people scared to farm on it because of the use of the pesticides and herbicides. But 
within that one TED Talk, bringing the land back within that fish pond system is a way to revitalize that soil and that water in that areas too. But then we have a whole big reforest thing to do to help bring back the fresh water to and repump those natural springs and everything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about Red Hill? Um, and what's Ooh, going on there? Got to dive too much in there. It's on, on Oahu Island, but mm -hmm. definitely the warnings have been given for a long time. Actually, my dad, what was that? Maybe 11, 12 years ago, they were con his company was contract. He cleans up crap that people mess up, you know, like the oil spills or the hazmat kind of stuff. And they had to repaint that those tanks that are buried in the ground to hold those jet fuel. And even their company gave that warning, like these tanks are too old. They're huge. They're a couple of stories high. And, and just to interrupt really quickly, in case people aren't aware, Red Hill is a U.S. Navy fuel fuel farm on Oahu, and it's underground steel tanks that are encased in concrete, and they hold are capable of holding like hundreds of millions of gallons of fuel. Yeah. Keep going. And there's been warnings from the community, from I don't know other agencies that these tanks are too old and they can leak. And there has been other leaks in the past. And a lot of that just gets hidden by whatever media or whatever else. But um, it finally went so deep that now the gas is coming up in all the drinking waters in homes and within that area and thousands of homes, you know, they can't even use their water to feed their animals or drink themselves or shower in. Or use. So it's a mess up situation there. And we're living on a rock on an island. <laughs> Once you mess that up, you mess that up. We don't know how long it's going to take. You can't really just drill into the ground to suck out all that bad water. It took thousands of years for that water to trickle into that water table to come back up in springs to provide life on these lands. Like every place else in the world, water is life. Definitely here. We never had money, um, currency um, before Western contact. Our word for wealth was, is vai vai. Vai is water. When you put two vai vai together, that shows wealth. And being able to balance that wealth within communities is the sign of life. And that is what the most important thing was for our people in this rock. <laughs> yeah, everybody knows you can't last long without water. Mm -hmm. um, so people are a lot of our friends and we, we try to support from this island. Uh, and it goes off into all other kind of stuff because yeah, water. We just try to support in there. We heard that I don't know. It's not not. We don't trust anything until it's really written in paper. But supposedly Pentagon's supposed to be covered in and help or to shut down those tanks finally. But we'll see. Let me see. Some some is just talking until it's actually done. Thank you for sharing um, a little bit about that. Um, Carl, can you tell us maybe some are, what are some of the like efforts to protect and revitalize fish populations and your culture that are like really giving you hope? You know, what's happening in the Pacific Northwest is a good example of, of, of the movement to deconstruct these mega dams that have blocked not only fish pa passage for salmon that are critical for so many species, as well as hundreds of tribes, um, like on the Columbia River and the Snake River dams. Uh, we're seeing uh, the revitalization of the culture there. And so yeah, as we're struggling in the Arctic and subarctic with, with some species collapse of the salmon, what we have now is a, is a, as, as a result, we're, we're seeing people coming together and talking of what the threats and the impacts are. And, you know, there's been this offshore threat for, you know, since the close of the, of the World War II, all these, industrial ships were created and the, those are some of these shipping technologies were created for industrial trawlers and so there's over 60 industrial trawlers in seattle that never even touched the shores of alaska that come up and scoop scoop in the north pacific and scoop in the midwater and bottom trawling there's different types of trawlers but there's interceptor fisheries as well 
so 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 part of it is getting is now there's there's been a there's been a movement by tribes coming together and creating commissions to work with western science indigenous knowledge to be able to come up with the solutions and 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 oh and so so the resistance to to, to trawling to addressing uh, on a global level addressing like McDonald's is calling this Pollock fish switch, fish sandwich, a sustainable fish, and it and it and it's being sold around the world where it's where our people are suffering as a result of these uh, types of things. But we have a awareness building. We have people rising up, uh, addressing, um, you know, going and including the, uh, you know, because these agricultural monocrops. Like the the these fertilizers and the processing, uh, uh, we end up with with the same toxins falling out in in the Arctic because because the slash and burn of these crops it goes into the atmosphere and falls out into the Arctic and so we we're having some of the same uh, uh, problems with uh, toxins even though we don't have, anyways, we're having the same problems with these agricultural, the, the, the global problems are, are, are in our bodies uh, in the Arctic as well. So, so, so any movement now to restore the globe on a global scale, uh, to, to restore migratory um, pathways, a place where birds, uh, fish, uh, pl pl just, just, just breaking down some of these barriers and walls and concrete, uh, jungles that have been created for the water as well as in communities uh, is huge, even the urban community. So like when the urban community can create a habitat that provides for the biodiversity, and it, it allows for the return of, of migratory species that we're dependent on for our culture. So, so it's, it's, it, that's the exciting thing that I see is the movement, it, it's, it's, it's important for this grassroots movement to restore the land, but also practice agro ecological practices, ag agro forestry practices, and agro aqua practices. So that's 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 the beauty that I see the people as the people that are on this call, but also just in the general movement for for restoring the earth and nature. Nice, thank you. And Teleke, what about you? What are some of the like efforts and movements um, that are giving you hope? Definitely it's our growing number of um, UIs or groups, nonprofits that are starting to step up and kind of look within their community and like, oh, we have a fish pond too. So it's like doing what they can. A lot of fish ponds are owned in different ways, privately or to the state or ranked as national historic sites and stuff. So um, there's a whole, every community has their hurdle to try to get to. Um, we are lucky now our nonprofit owns this fish pond so we could keep that into perpetuity. Um, some fish ponds are owned by hotels and you know, like that's now like more tourists run or you take the Hawaiian, put them in there as the showmaker and but it's not really grand as to feed the people you know it's feeding that tourism industry and the people that is own own that plot now but um definitely on the the revitalization side of our next generation more like more of the curriculum within the schools are being sprinkled with aina based subjects aina basis like the yeah the land that which feeds like subjects where to be within taro patches or fish ponds or fishing or farming and kind of getting that sprinkled in now and breaking away from the older doe education kind of you know putting that what is that called cultural bomb strategy of killing our uh, uh ripping away of us ourselves from our culture and lifestyles and you know language so even getting the language back up and being able to decipher a lot of our newspaper articles that were all written in Hawaiian we have over a million about a million documents left untranscribed yet within our our educational or the archives and a lot has been already so we still have a lot more information to come out and within that time with the printing press our kupuna realized that 
they got to start writing stuff down. We had from about a million population dropped to 40,000. Within that 40,000, we are the last. <laughs> we Everybody will trace to one of that 40,000 that still survived. Besides the ones that actually got to sail off and help populate within the Pacific Rim area. <laughs> but um, the ones that stood hold on the rock, um, we have that count there and still striving. The numbers are building. So that's a plus. And with that numbers building, we call that the iini, that that gut feeling in your na'au, that your, your stomach area. And we don't really think with our heart. We think with our stomach and it, those feelings within there. And those iinis thrive within the next generation and they want, they get hungry to, once they see all the, information going on like with the data like how history went and where we got to go what we got to correct and our food systems is definitely one of them in the fish ponds and yeah everything else that feeds our people mentally physically and spiritually thank you it's so great to hear from both of you about how close-knit these ecosystems are um and how really just community-based and supported uh innovations are the way to go um, we're going to open it up to Q&A now. Um, we're going to have John Russell from NAMA, Northwest Atlantic Marine Alliance, join us too. So if you have like broader questions that are like more just about like, I don't know, community supported fisheries or anything like that um, that aren't specifically for Carl or Peleke, uh, we have John on hand to answer them. Um, so please feel free to drop drop your questions in the chat, but we already, we already have some questions that we'll go through now. Um, so this one is from Mackenzie, and I think it's to Palike. Uh, what is the status with the ADC or the Agribusiness Development Corporation? So far, I know there's still, I guess, the agency that governing those ag lands. Um, we are, we are. I'm a, I am involved in another nonprofit that has been uh, teaming up with. Waimea High, so one of our high schools, to um, put in the ag um, class that kind of helping provide more opportunity to build more farmers or to teach more farmers, um, any kind of farmers, so that we can have another like influence in using those lands that you know have been used by misused by other companies for their own good and we can actually get the those lands used to feed our community but right now currently for the ADC I don't they, they're still holding on to that land um, we have some politicians representatives within the politicians trying to fight to get them out and we have been there, there has been sent out uh, what they called when you uh, brain fart petitions, sorry, um, to kind of get ADC out and put another entity in there or figure out another way because they had 20 years to and a lot of money to do something good and they blocked that. So they should have been given another chance. Anyway. So, yeah, that's where, as far as I know, it's at right now currently. They still are, are there, but we different community movements are trying to figure out what can do best to help change that. Thank you. Um, Carl, this question's for you. Um, a guest is in a community supported fishery group that sources coho from Kanai Red Fishery in Alaska. Uh, are they doing the right thing by supporting this fishery? Uh, what would you like them to do as an urban based fish lover who wants to respect this sacred fish? And is this a false market based solution? Let me know if you want me to repeat any of those questions. Oh, could you repeat that question, please? Yeah. Uh, so this person is in a community-supported fishery group that sources coho from Kenai Red Fishery in Alaska. Uh, their questions are, are they doing the right thing by supporting this fishery? And what would you like them to do as an urban-based fish lover who wants to respect this sacred fish? That's a good question. I, you know, I'm not uh, familiar with the specific project. Uh, if, if, if this is a... a, a you're supporting the, the Kenai processors, or if it's 
you, you know, I mean, on the, it, it, it used to be fairly well managed on the on the Kenai Peninsula. There's different management areas in Alaska. Um, I mean, I know that the Kenai run is has been a been a challenge. So, and it's been a challenge for Alaska Native people on the Kenai. I watched. You know the Kenai uh, uh, judge, uh, that that the current Kenai judge was arrested six times as a grandmother to just to get fish for for the indigenous peoples on the Kenai River in my lifetime. So it's and that's for subsistence or personal or cultural use. So it's it's. It's been a challenge because I know the Kenai is one of the most important fisheries for a lot of people, um, and um, that it's it's quite a challenge um, when you're dealing with so many users of of the fishery because we do want to sm- support our small commercial fisheries because that's that 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 is our small per, uh, commercial fisheries on the Yukon and the Kuskokwim and around uh, uh, Area M and these other, and Kodiak, uh, these areas are really important, not only for subsistence users, but provide some base for the uh, for the community uh, for, for the long winter months uh, to be able to feed their families or get school books and um, travel for medical. And I mean, these are really important fisheries. So, I I I can't I can't speak specifically for what that what that that what that project uh, the source sourcing project you're working on I'm not sure, but it, I I that as far as I know the Kenai fisheries are not um, industrial trawlers it's the trawlers that that are an interceptor fisheries these big mid uh, offshore industrial uh, factory trawlers that are that that are the biggest problem that I see. Um, so so I hope that answers your question. Is that it's the near shore, uh, very managed, highly managed uh, near shore and onshore fisheries are they're they're more regulated, and Alaska Native people are the most regulated of anybody. Where the offshore uh, fisheries are not that well managed and regulated. Mm-hmm. So I hope that helps. Thank you okay, for the question. You. And then John, I think you have something to add to that. Yeah, and um, I just want to point to um, the last question um, Tiffany asked both Pilek and Carl um, of just like what you know what's giving you hope, um, and they you know just listed a bunch of like community mobilizations that are happening, whether it's folks organizing, getting together to um, resist like the the mega dams being put up, whether it's folks um, like working to um, like take back fish ponds and understand like the, the cultural restoration there, people fighting the ADC to like get, get that land back. Um, all of this is like, is the work that needs to happen because the like, like frankly, across across Turtle Island, there's just not enough um, consumer points to support to allow for that to be like a powerful switch um, from like the current dynamics. And so, when we see these projects like um, the work Pilek is doing, the work Carl is doing, the work um, you know. Native folks and like black folks and brown folks, you know, folks all across Turtle Island are doing um, to the alternative. We got to like organize, mobilize and build around that, um, prevent what's stopping them from doing it and like, you know, build and support them to do it so that um, there are meaningful, more meaningful alternatives um, that everyone has access to. Um, another question is about hydro dams and how they affect fish populations. So, Carl, can you speak to that and also what sort of what kind of greenwashing goes along with this kind of energy? I think I'll start with the bigger picture. So, the greenwashing it started with multiple climate agreements that hydro was was a transition to to clean energy, but 
or green energy or whatever climate but, but but the studies that we're seeing especially through academia and and dam watch international um which which i'm a part of a large steering international steering committee um has been working to address this green washing issue i mean there's the proposals for dams on the planet is enough to change the ocean itself because the dams do affect ocean currents, on, especially on a mega scale. So on a global scale, uh, th these dams are affecting not just the ocean currents, but also um, the damming of rivers affects multiple species of fish. And some including like in the, including, uh, like lamprey in the in the Columbia River, um, th there was a, some massive proposals on the Yukon River, um, about eight hundred miles up river, um, to uh, create giant hydroelectric processes for oil and gas development. It's just for mining and extracting and then polluting more waters and land. So, so, so part of it is these dams behind the the dams. There's there's these uh, sediments that are and if there's mining and other agricultural and mining processes, the oil and gas, you end up with these, these toxic tailings also. So are toxic, I call them tailings, but they're actually dams. Um, and there's some some dams have created a whole tourism complex around them and as an economic boom. So there's a little bit of resistance to taking down these dams. But uh, yeah, the impacts to the fish are not just... Um, not just the blocking of the dams, but they affect the the the, the estuaries. They affect the, the on on the ocean's coast. They affect the entire coast of the ocean. So these these are these are hydro dams, mega hydro dams are not a solution to any type of uh, food security, uh, bio productivity, um, and they're not a solution to climate. They're, they're they, uh, some of these mega dams and have been found to be, be just as um, to have as much more greenhouse gases than even a coal burning power plant. So, so these are not solutions to to climate. Um, the mega industrial dams and there's a North American mega dam re resistance as well. There's another resource there for for folks. I hope that answers the question. I know that um, this isn't a question that anyone else has asked you yet, but uh, Peleke, you were talking earlier, and as you're talking, a helicopter flew over, and it was like a helicopter of tourists, and you mentioned um, the hotel, like, owned fish ponds. Can you speak a little bit to the, like, tourism industry in Hawaii and how it's meant and how it's impacting, like, locals and the food system and just everything? <laughs> Definitely. Uh, okay, that's a whole lot of portal to me. Um, what is that? Just for COVID, you know, it was like a re good reality check for us to reality slap for a lot of people who moved here more recently. Um, and based tourism, where a lot of the false misconception is like, oh, tourism is our number one economy maker or whatever, which is totally not true or not meant to be true. But the people who have made it that is the ones that need it to be true. Um, but basically for our people, we have been prostituting our culture since, you know, we were first put into that scene from kind of like from our natural hosting time of really being able to like host people to, oh, we should make money off of this and put the person there. Yeah. Uh, the prostitution of our culture at that part, but during this time, like it was a good check this past two years when tourism fully stopped and and I, all around the world, I guess, seeing, like, just seeing other places, like, animals coming here and, you know, sunblock not in the water and all of this other stuff that, you know, affects our climate that we don't really realize until it stops and then see things reacting from that, you know, the reaction that happens. So that was good to see. And we always, there's a good portion of, especially the farmers and I know people has, like, always been pushing that agriculture is our number one industry it should always have been and um and was before contact you know we were at one point we were feeding every like our whole all our islands had food and during the trade times we were feeding outside sending sweet potatoes and 
breadfruit and taro, kalo, two other portions of wherever those traders came from. And we were keeping up with it at that time. So there's no reason we should be doing that because right now we're 90% depending on the, the other side and trying to use tourism to be our number one moneymaker. Like, oh, we need the people to keep coming and damaging our resource in order to make the money, which our people ain't getting. It's right. more like pennies compared to what the corporate company that own those tourism getting the, the millions. So there is a way to do it. I believe tourism is still a good bonus use in it, but with or without it, like COVID showing, like people still had to eat. Whether you're sick or not, you still had to eat. So that industry would have been, you know, being able to fruit for our lands with food again, fish and dry stuff would be the number one. When tourists opens back up, there's a good way for all of our community to see too, like who really controlled the tourism industry. A lot of people changed their work industry now because of that and went into mm-hmm. farming or, you know, yeah, we had a lot of farmers grow since COVID because when you went in the store, all our our farming tools are gone <laughs> for a long time. But there were big changes and big reality checks for people like, oh, do I really want to keep hosting a person same thing over and over again? But if we could use, like we use the example of the fish pond, we definitely don't want to turn this farm plot into a tourism site and be the zombies of hosting the same thing over and over again. But if we had it controlled, like there is a group that brings people to Hawaii, but with the focus on fish ponds. Mm-hmm. That was this one we used to work at on Oahu. But they used to come once or twice a year. And everybody who came on that trip did their homework, did their study. They want to come and learn. And we're willing to host that kind of stuff and actually engage and teach because they come with their experience of other places. And then it's an actual good kind of tourism, you know, changing that face. Like we're going past the old school Elvis Presley tourism destination site, come to Hawaii, get laid and, you know, be wild or whatever. It's like, no, you can come to Hawaii, you can learn and see how our people survived here. We can cultural exchange. We can, there's a lot of sports exchange, sports, sports tourism is around, but ag, ag tourism, food tourism, you know, those kinds of focused tourism to be highlighted was, is where, you know, we want to, push and I was my first um stuff going into college was pre-tim program pre-travel industry management so Mm -hmm. being thrown in there and being the token Hawaiian in the group like you know they our people wasn't doing that in the much or you know just working our way through it but after I looked at it I did interviews with a lot of top managers within Waikiki and Kahala and most of them were single no family no no kids yet and they're way older than I would want to be with a family so it's like at that time I was like 18 I wanted family already <laughs> but at that time looking at that like man I don't want that job like that means then they said it like you know there's really no time for it you're consistently every single day 24 hours there's no there's no vacation because when the holidays are there you need to host the guys coming for their holiday so that's a whole different realm but yeah. hopefully that summed it up in, in a bit they could keep going some more but yeah thank you there's another question that um and you answered in the in the chat but if you could speak to it uh um you mentioned water quality concerns as a result of both land-based and sea-based activities um what are the major sea-based activities that impact water quality for the fish and fish ponds definitely nowadays would be just that regular pollution um we, we where our fish pond is every fresh pond is different um some will have less impact if the ocean is just wide open and just coming right in so it'd be really hard to mess that up when that case is would be the outflow of the fish pond and what's going into the ocean to feed that the fresh water still has to reach that open ocean so that's part of the balance within that system um and then because with that fresh water reaching there it's like the the seaweed, the limu, all the phytoplankton blooms and stuff. Um, for us, we are situated a little bit more inland. So there's a whole harbor blocking our main bay. The rock wall, you know, was built up for um, the wave action and stuff. When we look at the old pictures before the rock wall, the waves supposed to reach all the way up to our fish pond. So uh, 
flow is counted as a as a effect or you know to the health of this fish pond, not technically just chemicals. Like now today we have to look at oil spills, um, dredging, but busting up coral so that they can get um, you know access to certain spots, which kills the life. Like coral is our life within the water too. Without those coral reefs, the whole sea life falls um, with the seaweed and the water getting there and stuff. Uh, what else is that? They move a lot of sand here. People don't know how to, that's part of going back to the tourism stuff. Um, Waikiki, people don't realize that there are seasons within the, not all people, but some part of the tourism site. Like there's seasons, there's times the sands move. Winter time, it depletes. Summer times, it comes back. Um, but certain places, they want sand year round. So they take places, they take sand from one site and move to another. And that's a big effect of moving that sand and changing currents and waves and everything else. And yeah, to try to hide it like, oh no, it's not that, it's this moving around. Like, no, because ever since this whole portion of beach moved, now this side is eroding and this is happening. So there's a whole bunch of effects with that. Um, but definitely takes two parts of the, the ocean effects kind of was trying to, what is that, a Adriana? Um, trying to, answer that too so the fish pond itself too has that kuleana so as it's taking resource from the fresh water that it uses within the pond and then sends that back out to finish off because there's still a whole other system within our shorelines our near shoreline that has that needs all that same resource too so keeping ourselves in check to to keep that balance of the fish pond is also kind of what i was trying to shoot at in a nutshell it's awesome listening to you talk about the ice yeah sea ice the yep. sea ice, and when you mentioned the phytoplankton, zooplankton bloom, I was like, awesome. That is exactly what the base of the fish ponds are. Like just that, that the sweet waters that help start that whole life process. The bottom, the bottom tier of the food chain. Without that, we don't have that life start building up again. So just to hear your guys' version of how that vimomona, that sweet waters are still within, you know, like how it's recognized within your system. I was like, oh. Same thing, same thing. So awesome. Or Kupura talk about like when ranching came with the, the cattle, the cattling and stuff and ranching. And it's like, oh, our people did that, but in the ocean, like we didn't have um, cows and stuff before, like pig and dog and birds were like our main land animals, but everything else was in the ocean and they were herding all these schools of fish within there and we had fish that could help bring in schools you wouldn't eat those and they were like treated like dogs like if you youtube some guys are doing it in like those what's it called sea aquarium places but teaching a fish to grab a ball and put it inside the hoop and stuff i was like right there if they get to do that for their job and train a fish to do that you imagine our kupuna like people who don't believe in the stories of them training a barracuda to go grab a school of fish and bring them back closer into the <laughs> to the shoreline so it's been a rough road to, to on this restoration um i've watched the uh, one indigenous language in, in alaska completely be extinct in my lifetime mm. uh there's still about 400 people left but the language is completely gone it's in the archives now so it's uh it's real peleke and so it's important what you're doing it's important what we are doing. Um, so we only have a few minutes left and um, just wanted to thank you all for joining us and thank you so much, Carl and Peleke. Um, uh, Kira dropped some links in the chat box. So if you wanted to please sign up to Real Food Media's newsletter so you can stay up to date with everything that we're doing. And um, obviously we'll have links to these recordings and a beautiful illustration by Maisie Richards too. Um, which we'll be sharing shortly, um, like in a week or so. She did one for our soil event. It turned out beautifully. So if you want to get to know her, I'm dropping a link to her website in, in the chat box now. Um, yeah, thank you so much, Carl and Pleke and John. Um, really appreciate all of you. Right. I want to extend a quick mahalo to all you guys, too, to, in, um, for throwing this on everybody that's been attending. It's quick. A quick Oli, a chant from me to you all uh, for mahalo. Thank you. 
Guyana. Kama una okali ukua a, iku mako me kama halo, aloha aloha e, e kau aloha vale mai laka ua e. Kama una okali ukua a, iku mako me kama halo, aloha aloha e, iku mako me kama halo, aloha aloha e. Mahalo nui, keep up the fight, and yeah, catch you guys around in the next next visit. <laughs> well, we've got quite a few celebration songs, the welcoming songs, so uh, some some pretty old ones from the water. Mm. But yeah, yeah, there's a song when you're doing that, when you're coming back to land, coming back to shore. Hmm. <laughs> So that's the general general song. It's still it's still played. Thank you so much. Thanks for thanks all of you for joining us. Um, again, we'll have our recordings produced. They'll be on our website. So Carl, Peleke, and Tiffany and John, thank you for joining us at the new school at Commonweal. Don't take it, don't don't don't. Don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, don't, 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 don't take it, 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 don't, 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 River is a healer, the river is a sink, the river knows no end. The river feels no way.